Hello, friends, and welcome to Sterile Field Guide, a podcast dedicated to medical student general surgical education. I'm Alex, and I'll be your guide. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 12. In this episode, we are going to jump right back into clinical stuff, continuing on speaking about trauma. And in this episode, we are going to start talking about solid organ injuries. This is going to be a three-part episode because there are three solid organs that I want to talk to you about. So when I say solid organ, what am I talking about? I am talking specifically about the spleen, liver, and kidneys, although some people also consider the pancreas and the adrenal glands to be solid organs. And I'm speaking about organs in the abdomen. Obviously there are other organs in your body. So solid abdominal organs that we are going to talk about in different episodes are going to be the spleen, liver, and the kidney. And then pancreas and adrenal glands, I consider those separately. Some people consider those together. We can talk about pancreatic and adrenal gland injuries in other episodes, but that's sort of not the topic of conversation today. And just for completeness sake, because we're talking about solid organs, I want to also make you aware, you probably already know this, but if there are solid organs, there are also hollow hollow organs, and we consider these to be hollow viscous organs. This includes the stomach, the small and large bowel, the rectum, sort of all of the GI tract is considered a hollow viscous organ. So the literature focuses, like I mentioned, on spleen, liver, and kidney. So we are going to start off by talking about one of my favorite organs, the spleen today. So just for general review, talking about the function of the spleen really briefly, the spleen does an excellent job filtering our blood. It has a lot of immune and lymphoid function. And one of its specific immune functions is responding to encapsulated bacteria through opsonization. You probably talked about this in either your first or second year when you were covering microbiology and infectious diseases, but some of the really important encapsulated bacteria that the spleen protects us from are going to be streptococcus pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitis. It's hard to say that word, but you can remember these actually with a mnemonic, um, you may have heard this before, SHIN, S-H-I-N, so S for strep pneumo, H, I for Haemophilus influenza, and N for Neisseria meningitis. This is a question that I had been asked on rounds before and also is actually super pertinent for the management of traumatic spleen injuries. So although it feels like just a fun fact, this is actually really clinically important. So then also for thinking about you going into a surgery where they are operating on the spleen or may ask you about splenic anatomy. Some anatomy that I would encourage you to review is going to be the celiac trunk and then branches off of the splenic artery. So just general with my words, obviously looking at pictures and practicing this with your dissections is going to be more helpful than me just telling you, but knowing the branches of the celiac trunk, which are going to be your common hepatic artery, your left gastric artery, and your splenic artery. And then speaking about the splenic artery, so one of the branches of the celiac trunk, talking about some of the pertinent branches, you probably may have heard of the short gastrics and the gastroomental branches, which are coming from sort of the distal portion of the splenic artery as we get closer to the spleen and the gastric area, but also some really important branches that come off the splenic artery are some pancreatic branches, such as the greater pancreatic artery, the dorsal pancreatic artery, and the inferior pancreatic artery, which is also known as the transverse pancreatic artery. So this is important because if you are taking out the spleen, you're going to need to know like what vessels do you need to tie off. There's also veins, and the veins are also pretty pretty mirroring. So you're going to have your short gastric veins, you're going to have your pancreatic veins, you're going to have your splenic vein. And knowing sort of the physiology of the splenic vein, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is important to know as well when you're thinking about doing a splenectomy or an embolization. It's important for you to know these vessels because if you are cutting the spleen out, you need to know like, okay, I I know that the branches of the splenic artery are important for pancreatic function. So I don't actually want to tie the spleen off like totally close to the celiac trunk because that's going to cut off the blood flow that we're getting from the splenic artery to the pancreas. But you also want to know like, hey, there are also some branches of the splenic artery closer to the spleen, like the short gastrics that you need to make sure that you're controlling the bleeding of when you're taking the spleen out. 
The pancreatic branches are also super important when you're thinking about an embolization and the anatomy there. And so we'll talk about that, but these are just some things for you to review to be sort of a rock star on splenic and some pancreatic anatomy. So talking about how you can injure your spleen when we're thinking of a trauma situation, obviously there are other things in the world besides trauma, but we are speaking specifically about trauma. We like to think of injuries in two big buckets, and these are going to be blunt versus penetrating. So a penetrating injury, pretty easy to understand, is going to be something sharp entering a cavity. So this is like a gunshot wound, a stab wound, you were impaled with something. So sometimes people are in car accidents and get blunt injuries, but then they're impaled by a tree branch. And that is a penetrating injury as well as blunt injury. And so that sort of leads us into blunt injuries. Blunt injuries are going to be things like car accidents, football injuries, or any sort of like sports injury where you're running into each other, getting hit by a car as a person, having a bicycle accident, running into a tree, sledding into a tree, all those different things where you can just like run into stuff or have something run into you is going to be a blunt injury. This also includes like battery, like assault and battery, like if somebody's punching you, as long as you're not entering a cavity, that is going to be a blunt injury. So those are the two big buckets that we like to think about things. And then when we're thinking about evaluating these injuries, we talked about the primary and the secondary survey for trauma in prior episodes. And in those episodes, we talked about some physical exam findings that are going to be like concerning that there is something going on intra-abdominally, but we'll go ahead and review those here. Something that makes total sense is that if you have a splenic injury, you are going to have a painful abdomen usually typically and we know that the spleen is located in the left upper quadrant so you may have left upper quadrant pain you may have flank pain some other signs that you you may think like okay yeah I'm a little bit worried for a splenic injury or that the spleen could be injured is if you have broken ribs on the left side especially those lower ribs we know that the lung ends eventually and those ribs are covering some intra-abdominal space and so if you break those ribs and they're puncturing into the capsule or somehow causing a laceration or a contusion of the spleen that is something that might clue us in. Another thing that is like a fun exam finding is called CARES sign or KER sign, K-E-H-R. And this is when you have left shoulder pain from a splenic injury. And you may have heard of this before, you may not have, but referred pain from the diaphragm goes to the shoulder. So if you have like a liver injury, you may have pain in your right shoulder. If you have a splenic injury, you may, pain, may have pain in your left shoulder. Some pregnant women, if their baby Babies are specifically like pushing up against one side or the other may have pain in their shoulders and feel like they need a massage, but really just like getting baby out is really helpful. So that's a fun fact about referred pain. And this one is called Kerr. I'm going to stick with Kerr sign. That feels right, but it's K-E-H-R. It may be said differently. I don't know. (laughs) Other things to think about is like, like I mentioned, oh yeah, is it blunt or penetrating? But thinking about the mechanism of injury is actually really important for you to be like, what am I worried about? Especially if your patient has a GCS of three, which means that they're not talking to you. They're not telling you what happened. You have no idea what's going on. They're intubated. They're not responding to pain. We've paralyzed them. Like, what do we do now? So seeing like a seatbelt sign, seeing bruising over the abdomen, having a swollen abdomen, a distended abdomen, an abdomen that's tense and firm, something that's concerning for peritonitis. Those things are important to think about. And then when you're thinking about a patient who has an organ injury that has a lot of blood supply, like the spleen does, you want to be thinking about like, what are their hemodynamics? And so when we think about hemodynamic instability, we spoke about this before, but if somebody is profusely bleeding into their abdomen, we are thinking about things like the first thing that you're going to see actually actually is You may know this, we may have spoken about this before, but the first thing you'll see if people are in hemorrhagic shock is you're going to see a, like a shortening, a narrowing of the pulse pressure because your diastolic pressure. So the pulse pressure, if you're not familiar, is the difference between your systolic and your diastolic pressure. 
And your diastolic pressure is going to increase because your body is really, really smart. And because you're losing a lot of blood, you're losing a lot of volume, your body's like, let's clamp down. And so that diastole, that sort of relaxation period is not as relaxed. So your diastolic pressure is going to increase. Your systolic pressure may decrease, but what you're going to see very, the very, very first sign is typically a narrowing of your pulse pressure. Other things you can start to see as you lose more blood are going to be tachycardia. You'll see tachycardia before you see low blood pressure. And once you start to see low blood pressure, you've lost a pretty significant amount of blood at that point. We may have spoken about this before. We can go over sort of what like classes of hemorrhagic shock and how to evaluate that. But that's something to be looking out for when you are in a trauma is, okay, is their pulse pressure super narrow? Okay, I'm worried that they're losing volume oh my gosh, they're already tachycardic. All right, that means that they've lost this percent of blood. Oh my goodness, now their blood pressure is low. That's when you start to be like, okay, they've lost a lot of blood to be hypotensive. You can really, really like compensate. And so once you get to a hypotensive state, you're like, you've, you're really behind. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about the vital signs and people may ask you this, but also just really important to know as a clinician to be like aware of those things. Cause I think as a med student, when I first started out, I did not pay attention to the pulse pressure. So I was like, oh, well, they're they're not hypotensive, so they're fine. But the pulse pressure is something to keep in mind. Okay, moving on from pulse pressure, getting off my soapbox. Um, some diagnostic imaging things. We talked about the FAST exam in um, a prior episode, but the FAST exam, if you haven't listened to that, is an ultrasound that is typically used in trauma. It's like focused assessment of sonographic trauma or something like that. But basically you are doing a four, a four category ultrasound super fast, less than a minute if possible, where you're looking at the interface of the spleen and the kidney, the interface of the liver and the kidney at the bladder and the pouches and the pelvis and then up at the heart. And if you have a positive FAST exam, um, it can be positive in the left side. You can see blood um, around the spleen sort of collecting under the capsule or if it's ruptured, you can maybe see it in the like spleno-renal fascia. And then in Morrison's pouch, which is the interface between the liver and the kidney, you can also see blood there, which is pretty sensitive. That can be negative even if you have a splenic injury or even if you have blood in your abdomen. So if it's positive, that is telling you, yes, there is free fluid in the abdomen. But if it's negative, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is fine. So another thing that you can do is get a CT scan. And typically in traumas, they're going to do a portal phase CT scan, which basically means, so there's a couple different ways to do a CT scan and we don't have to get into all the mechanisms, but you can do a total arterial. So like a CTA, um, a CT arterial, you can do a CTV, CT venous, and then sort of in between is going to be the mixing of arterial and venous, which is the portal phase. And this is going to give us one shot view to see sort of like what's going on. So if you get a portal phase or like a trauma CT scan, um, you can see like blush. Blush is a word that we use when we are thinking about, okay, yes, I can see that there is active extravasation or there is blood leaving this vessel. So there's con- contrast sort of like spilling into a space that is no longer a vessel. That is going to be called blush. If you hear that word or active extrav, that is a sign that you are bleeding actively from a vessel, typically arterial, and that is a bad sign. Other things that you can see on CT scan that are worrying are things like a pseudo aneurysm. So when we talk about an aneurysm versus a pseudo aneurysm, this is a really important distinction to make. And I think it can be hard as a medical student when you're first starting out to know what's going on when they're talking about pseudo aneurysms. So we know that blood vessels have three big layers that we need to know about. You have the tunica intima, which is going to be the innermost layer. You have the media and the adventitia. So tunica intima in the inside, media in the middle, adventitia on the outside. So when you have a true aneurysm, an aneurysm is like a stretching and outpouching of all three layers. And so you have your vessel, but there's a defect that includes all three layers and it's sort of pouching out like a little polyp or you have stretching on all all sides. There are different kinds of aneurysms. But for the sake of this discussion, the difference between an aneurysm and a pseudo aneurysm is an aneurysm is an outpouching that involves all three layers. And so while it is a deformation in the blood vessel, all three of those layers are still intact and are surrounding the blood. 
in a pseudo aneurysm, three layers are no longer intact. So you have a disruption of a layer or two layers or even all three layers and you are at an increased risk of rupture. And so when I say, I know it's confusing to be like, oh yeah, you have a disruption of all three layers. Doesn't that just mean that you're bleeding out with, with that's not an aneurysm anymore. You're just bleeding from a vessel. So actually you can have, you can have disruption of total all three layers of a blood vessel and have a pseudo aneurysm because you have a little, like a fibrous capsule. The hematoma is somehow containing the blood flow. It's pushed up against something which is somehow containing the blood flow. And you have, you can see this on imaging. You can see your pseudo aneurysm um, forming. And that is concerning because with an aneurysm, alone, we know with like aortic aneurysms, we are concerned that that is going to rupture eventually because those walls are stretched out and they're thin, but it's all three layers. And so if you have less than three layers and it's stretched out and thin, and you have this traumatic mechanism, you are even more worried that that is going to bleed. So pseudo aneurysms are scary. And even though it says pseudo aneurysm, like, oh, it's a fake aneurysm, we don't care. It's actually worse than an aneurysm to have a pseudo aneurysm. So remember the layers of your blood vessel. You may be ask that, but also I think just big picture things, good to know that a pseudo aneurysm is scary. It's a disruption of blood vessels. It's not contained by all three, and it can be a total disruption of the blood vessel wall and contained by something exogenous to the blood vessel. So just keep those things in mind when thinking about pseudo aneurysms. So anyway, those things are pretty scary, right? And so we have the splenic injury. We either have, you can have contrast blush, you can have a pseudo aneurysm. Um, There are ways to characterize splenic injuries and some of them are scarier than others. And so the AAST or the American Association for Surgical Trauma has a great scale for solid organ injuries and spleen is included in that. And so I want to take you through very, very briefly. You do not need to memorize these things, but thinking about how you will hear people on trauma say, okay, it's a grade, a grade two splenic injury, or it's a grade five. And so we took them to the OR and it's good to know sort of like what they're talking about. So there will be pictures of all of this on the Instagram. I have drawn some pretty pictures for you and then included some primary literature for you to review, but summarize the big key points, but it's important to remember that the spleen has a capsule and the capsule is really important for thinking about the grade of the injury. We know that the spleen has a hilum where the arteries and the veins are coming in. Then also the short gastrics are popping off. And so just important to sort of know the general anatomy when thinking about splenic injuries. So a grade one splenic injury is going to be a subcapsular hematoma, less than 10% of the surface area of the spleen. So this is contained hematoma, not actively bleeding on imaging, or you can have a parenchymal laceration, so a cut in the actual spleen that is less than one centimeter deep, okay? And all of this is gonna be summarized, so don't even worry about it, but basically as we go up in grade, all of those things can increase. So the subcapsular hematoma gets bigger in a grade two, the parenchymal laceration gets bigger in a grade two, or you can start to have interparenchymal hematoma, so where the, there's bruising of the actual tissue itself. Um, and so as you go up and up and up, you start to have more severe things like that. And then eventually, once you get um, into higher grades, you can start to have active bleeding from the spleen. And I believe that starts at grade four. And that includes pseudoaneurysms. So we equate active bleeding and pseudoaneurysms because pseudoaneurysms, like we mentioned, have um, the ability to start actively bleeding and are really, really scary. So I won't go through like all of the measurements because you can find that on the Instagram. And frankly, it's not important for you to memorize at this point because you're not a radiologist, you're not a trauma surgeon at this point, and also you're probably just going to review it later and later and later. But as you get higher, main points from one to five, five is like totally shattered spleen. You've got active bleeding into the abdomen. One is you have a tiny cut or a hematoma. And all this to say, there are different ways to manage these different injuries because obviously like a little bruise on your spleen versus a totally shattered spleen are going to be different levels of emergencies. So there is a lot, a lot, a lot of data 
on non-operative management of low-grade spleen injuries. In fact, I have a paper on management of low-grade spleen injuries, which I'll put a little QR code on the Instagram and sort of summarize our findings. But basically, it's pretty recommended now that we do non-operative management of low-grade spleen injuries. And what does that mean? That means that we are going to watch these patients and perform what's called a serial abdominal exam. So a serial abdominal exam is just like it sounds. You do abdominal exams frequently and at sort of a predefined interval, depending on your institution, but every couple of hours, the same person is going to go touch the same belly and compare their notes. These are documented in the chart. Every couple of hours, the same individual is going to see if they feel any difference. And then ideally, if you're doing a serial abdominal exam, you are not going to be in the hospital for days and days and days or like multiple shifts in a row typically. And so what you will do, ideally, if there is time, you will go to the patient room with the person who is taking over for you and you will perform the exam together and you'll be like, this is their baseline you feel what I'm feeling. This is this is what it should feel like. And so that person sort of has an idea of what's going on. So this is a, a big tip for you when performing serial abdominal exams, especially when you start getting into residency, is to know that it's really awesome if you can do a handoff like that, like an active handoff to be like, come with me, let's go do this exam together because we're really concerned about this patient, we're watching them. And it needs to be the same. And it's important to document these in the chart. Okay, anyway, so we talked about our serial abdominal exams. One thing that I want to tell you is for non-operative management, we're going to watch them. We're going to do their serial abdominal exams. And we're probably going to check their labs to see if their hemoglobin is dropping. And if they are dropping, we can give them blood products. One caveat to all of this, it does not matter what your grade of injury is. If you are hemodynamically unstable, if you have a continuous blood product requirement, if you may even need to be put on pressors, we're not going to watch you anymore. I don't care if it's a grade one. I don't care if it's a grade five. Something needs to be done to stabilize you. And that's something, especially if you're hemodynamically unstable, is probably going to be a splenectomy. You are going to go to the OR and you're going to take it out. So even if, big takeaway from this, if you have a grade one injury, the spleen looks almost totally normal on CT scan. If that patient is hemodynamically unstable with a trauma mechanism, you assume that they are bleeding and you are very concerned. Okay, so even low grade, hemodynamically unstable needs an intervention. We are not going to watch that. So this is the big caveat is like, yes, low grade injuries. We like to watch them. Non-operative management is sort of standard of care right now. However, do not watch patients who are hemodynamically unstable. And if somebody you know is watching somebody who's hemodynamically unstable, you should kindly be like, hmm, this person's blood pressure is this. Why are we doing that? Um, And if they don't respond to that, maybe like politely play dumb with somebody who's a little bit higher up than them and sort of elevate this. If somebody's hemodynamically unstable, you need to be doing something, probably. Some reasons why you would not do non-operative management, um, like we mentioned, hemodynamically unstabi- instability, and then some, a relative contraindication um, to non-operative management is portal hypertension. So like a history of cirrhosis with evidence of portal hypertension, because if you think about the portal venous system, we know that the splenic vein is a tributary to that. And if you have portal hypertension, you are going to have reversal of portal flow. And so you're going to have more pressure in the splenic vein pushing back into the spleen. And if you have an injury in your spleen, you're trying to control bleeding, watching that with portal hypertension with this like super pressurized system to a highly vascular organ is just feels like a recipe for disaster. We haven't spoken about this, but patients with liver disease are also at a huge increased risk of like morbidity and mortality with any sort of surgery. And we can calculate this with the child Pew score. And we're not talking about that specifically today. So it's like complicated taking care of patients who have liver disease and it's very dangerous and risky. And so these are just things to keep in mind. 
All right. And then complications of non-operative management. A lot of the times it works really, really well. And some things that we worry about are going to be like a late bleed. So failure of of non-operative management typically includes bleeding. And this often occurs around day nine post-injury. So around like a week and a half to two weeks after your injury, patients can present with a pseudoaneurysm or re-bleeding and they will come back to the hospital if you give them specific return precautions. And return precautions are basically what you tell a patient to come back for. And this is a really good skill to learn or to start to think about in the hospital for all kinds of injuries, not even just on trauma. But a return precaution is like, hey, what is happening to you? What could happen to you given your disease pattern? And what would really concern me? And why would I really, really, really want you to tell somebody that this is happening to you or present back to the emergency room? So with a splenic injury, that you are managing non-operatively and maybe a splenic injury that you are managing operatively, especially with the non-operative managements, you have that risk of pseudoaneurysm pseudoaneurysm formation and delayed bleeding. And so what would you be concerned about if you're sending them out into the wild? I would be concerned for bleeding. And what are some signs that they would be bleeding? That would be like new or worsening abdominal pain, signs of hypotension, like dizziness, passing out, signs of infection, people can get abscesses. um, So like fevers and chills, also dizziness and passing out from like a shock state or like extreme, extreme fatigue where you're like getting winded after going up a flight of stairs, you have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity because you're losing blood and you can no longer supply oxygen to all of the organs in your body that are needed to do regular tasks. So those would be my return precautions. Um, Some people will say different things for that, but I think big buckets, if you're concerned for somebody bleeding, you're concerned for an organ injury. I'm worried about bleeding. I'm worried about hypotension. I'm worried that you could get an infection. So here's what I'm going to tell you. So think about that for all of your patients, not just your traumatic injury patients. If you just had a baby and you're going home, what are my return precautions for you? What am I concerned that could happen to you? And be thinking about those things because that is really helpful when like anticipating needs of patients. Sometimes your residents will ask you what the return precautions will be, or they will ask you to explain them to a patient. So start thinking about these sort of early and that will set you up for success. Awesome. So how long do you do serial abdominal exams? There's not a ton of data, but I have a little bit of data. This is what my paper's on. There's no consensus right now, but for low grade injuries for patients who are not on blood thinners, who do not have other giant giant injuries, it's about nine hours um, before we know if we need to be giving them anything or give them any more blood. So just think about those sorts of things, but there's no consensus right now. Other things you can do for patients, I mentioned this already, is give them blood. So if they are pretty hemodynamically stable, but their hematocrit and hemoglobin have dropped, you can give them units of blood. You can reverse their anticoagulation. That can be really helpful to reduce bleeding, and sometimes that's all people need. Another thing that we mentioned, if your non-operative management is not working or you're like, this is concerning, like if someone has a pseudoaneurysm but they're totally stable, you can think about embolization. This is something that our interventional radiology colleagues often do. And there is a proximal versus a distal embolization. From what I read, and maybe you can correct me, but there's no difference in outcomes between a proximal and a distal embolization. However, when I was on interventional radiology, the team I was with preferred proximal embolizations. And so where the proximal embolization occurs is between the greater and the dorsal pancreatic artery. So they like to go right past that if possible, if it's like a perfect embo and they have lots of space, put their coil in so that the blood is still coming from the celiac artery. It's going to go into the greater and travel back into the splenic artery, sort of in the circuitous. There's like an anastomosis that allows the blood from the celiac artery to go around the coil and into the spleen. And I was like, that's crazy. Aren't you concerned for bleeding? Why would you be reperfusing the spleen? But what happens is these arteries are communicating back to the splenic artery. They can maintain a low pressure perfusion to the spleen, which allows for the clots and stuff to form and those vessels to sort of seal off and do what they need to do. 
without this huge pressure gradient behind them. And so you may have a little bit of oozing from your spleen after, but the frank bleeding and the concern for total rupture sort of goes down and those things heal up. Um, so the benefit of this is that the spleen maintains some function, but your acute bleeding stops. And so when I spoke to you earlier about the functions of the spleen, we know that the spleen is important for opsonizing these encapsulated bacteria. So when you take the spleen out, you have to give them vaccines for those bugs that we spoke about, which are strep pneumo, haemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitis. So people need those vaccines again if they get their spleen taken out. And so if you do an embolization, you maintain enough splenic perfusion as long as the spleen isn't totally trashed. So if you're like perfusing a totally dead spleen, that's different. But if you have enough splenic tissue to go on and you do your proximal splenic embolization and you totally nail that little pancreatic roundabout that goes back into the splenic artery, you can maintain enough pressure and perfusion that you don't need to give those vaccines. You may give them anyway, but the risk of infection is lower. So that's great. There is a relative contraindication documented in patients who are greater than 55 for an embolization because the failure rates increase with age um, pretty pretty sharply once you get up into the 70s, but this could still be a useful management choice initially, and then you can manage, um, you can continue to monitor, and if something goes wrong, you can consider splenectomy. And then when we spoke about splenectomy, that is going to be the operation where the patient's hemodynamically unstable or the spleen is just simply not going to work for them, and an embolization is not a great choice, Um, or they have some other some other injury in their abdomen that you need to do surgery for, you can go in and take the spleen out if it is causing issues. And you can talk about the sort of the operative management of spleen splenectomies and sort of watch those, but basically you need to tie the vessels off and make sure things aren't bleeding. And you want to allow the pancreas to continue to get blood flow. And so you probably aren't going to do a super proximal splenic artery tie off. Sometimes a splenectomy happens happens along with a distal pancreatectomy. So if we think about the anatomy of a splenic artery and veins, we know that those travel in really, really close proximity to the pancreas. And so with this, if you have injury to splenic vessels, you sometimes can have injury to the pancreas as well. And so sometimes people will do a splenectomy with distal pancreatectomy, or if you're unable to get the spleen out safely and get a really great margin without disrupting the pancreas, you may have to do a splenectomy with distal pancreatectomy in that case. And often with these surgeries, you will leave a drain. And the reason is, so I learned this sort of recently, it makes sense, but drains are not usually left in just to drain blood. Like typically you should leave a surgery and not need to drain a whole bunch of blood off, but you'll put a drain in if you're concerned for something that you need to monitor. So for example, if you do a distal pancreatectomy, you can be concerned for a chyle leak. Um, You can be concerned for like pancreatic juices just flowing into the wild. And so what you'll do is you'll leave your JP drain in there. And if it starts to look murky and concerning for pancreatic fluid, you can test it for lipase or amylase, and then you're like, oh my gosh, we have a pancreatic leak. So you'll put a JP drain in if you do a distal pancreatectomy just to monitor for those sorts of things. We already talked about serial abdominal exams. You can do these post-operation as well just to make sure that patients are feeling a little bit better. But then also while you're doing these serial abdominal exams, especially in non-operative management, you want to keep your patients NPO, which means they're not eating anything just in case you need surgery. Because if you're familiar, you know that you cannot or should not get anesthesia and be intubated if you have eaten or drank a whole bunch recently because you have just a huge risk of aspiration um, and hurting your lungs. And that's just not something that you need on top of already being sick and it's not safe. So you'll keep your patients uh, NPO while you're doing these serial abdominal exams. We already talked about return precautions, which was my last bullet point. So basically in summary, review your anatomy, think about the grades of splenic injuries and what the management would be. And remember, remember, remember that it does not matter what the grade is. 
if somebody's hemodynamically unstable, something needs to be done. Okay. Or you need to look somewhere else because if the spleen looks totally fine and you're not concerned for bleeding at all, where, where is their blood going? Okay. So be on the lookout for those sorts of things. Remember the little tip about the pulse pressure. Remember your vaccines for when you take a spleen out. Remember why you put a JP drain in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was really fun talking to you about the spleen. This is one of my favorite, favorite organs. Obviously one of my favorites because I've spent so much time thinking about it, but I hope this was helpful for you and that you learned some, some tidbits that you can use on the warts. All right, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. That's it for today's podcast. You can support this podcast and receive exclusive educational content on Patreon and find us on Instagram at Sterile Field Guide. Questions and requests can be submitted to our Gmail at sterilefieldguide at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. And until next time, may your retraction be superb and your suture tails be the perfect length.